Good afternoon, it's good to be with you. Uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna be speaking on inflammation in Durkheim's disease, its contribution to pain, and a couple of novel strategies to reduce it. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Just uh, first, a couple of disclosures. I am an investigator in the cardiovascular inflammation reduction trial and in the Ozonamod Crohn's disease trial. Now, Durkheim's disease, it's also known as adiposis dolorosa which literally means painful fat. And it's characterized by the development of fibrotic, lumpy, subcutaneous adipose tissue which can occur anywhere in the body and is accompanied by inflammation and extreme pain. It's accompanied by inflammation because it is an immune-mediated chronic inflammatory disease, which is in a group of other more common chronic inflammatory diseases, all of which share common inflammation pathways which lead to uh, inflammation and can result from or be triggered by a dysregulation of the normal immune response. Now, inflammation is a complex biological response of vascular tissues to injury or harmful stimuli. And inflammation can be normal, but it also can be pathologic as it is in chronic inflammatory disease. And when inflammation continues chronically, it's characterized in the affected tissues by an influx of macrophages, lymphocytes, and other types of immune cells, and it is the macrophage and the lymphocyte that I'm gonna be focusing on today. Now, chronic inflammation, one way it can represent is a, a low-grade, low-level type of inflammation that persists without ever reaching a resolution phase. And it's that type of inflammation that's present in obesity-related adipose tissue inflammation. Now, the term autoinflammation, it can be used interchangeably with innate immune-mediated inflammation because it's now possible to draw comparisons between autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases. So Durkheim's disease could actually be considered an autoinflammatory disease. Now, few patients who have this condition would argue the fact that having it is really such a pain. And that's because the, one of the things that the inflammation does is cause what's called chemical nociceptive pain, amongst other types of pain. The pain in Durkheim's disease can be severe, it can be disabling, and it can reduce a patient's quality of life. In a 2012 NIH survey of patients who were experiencing chronic pain, a majority of them reported that the pain disrupted their, their daily life activities and had a negative impact on their personal relationships. Now, I had mentioned that I was gonna be talking about macrophages. Macrophages are a type of white, of, uh, white blood cell that ingests foreign material, and because they do that, they've been referred to by some as the Pac-Man of the immune system. Now, macrophages play a role in the normally functioning immune system, but they also play a significant role in chronic inflammatory diseases. And, they're norm and one of the places they can be found is in the connective tissues in the body. And perhaps you may know that there are some that is referred to Durkheim's disease as being a, disease, a connective tissue disease. Now, macrophages, they can exist in two states. One is a quiescent or a resting state, and the other is in an activated state. And, when, and among the, the activated macrophages, there are two classifications. Number one is the classically activated, or M1 macrophage, and the other is the alternatively activated, or M2 macrophage. And it's the classically activated, or M1 macrophages, that promote and encourage inflammation, and those, that's the one I'm gonna be focused on today. And for short, I'll just be referring to it as the MAC, or the MAX. Now cytokines, these are any number of substances such as interferon, uh, interleukin, growth factors that are secreted by certain cells of the immune system and have an effect on other cells. Now these MACs, they secrete pro-inflammatory pro cytokines such as interleukin-6, interleukin-1-beta, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Now Durkheim's disease, as I mentioned, is a chronic inflammatory disease. And as such, these, these MACs play a significant role in this disease as they do in other more common chronic inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and, and atherosclerosis. And the medical scientific literature supports both the presence and activities of these MACs in Durkheim's disease. Now, in general, 
as adiposity increases and, ob and obesity and with, the, and the, with the onset of obesity, there is an increase in the adipose tissue of these MACs. And as they increase, there is a corresponding increase in the amount of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF and IL-6. As TNF and IL-6 increases, that then contributes to the development of the metabolic syndrome, which you heard a little bit about earlier today. With insulin resistance being a component of the metabolic syndrome, with the onset of insulin resistance, then comes the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So this is the connection between obesity and the development of diabetes, with diabetes being a coronary artery disease risk equivalent. This is the connection between obesity and the development of the metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes, and with type 2 diabetes being a, what's called a coronary artery disease risk equivalent. Now, I mentioned IL-6. It's been found to be present at increased levels in Durkheim's disease, in patients who have Durkheim's disease. Now, the, there's a drug that targets the IL-6 inflammation pathway, and that drug is the drug methotrexate. It's actually a rheumatoid arthritis drug, but it's been studied recently in the cardiovascular inflammation reduction trial. Now, if you're interested in learning about that trial, it has its own website, uh, www.thecert.org. Tumor necrosis factor alpha, that's another endogenous chemical along with interleukin-6, which is active in inflammation and is also secreted by these MACs. Now, there are two drugs that target and inhibit tumor necrosis factor alpha along with, with, with others. Uh, one drug is infliximab and the other is etanercept. Now, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which I mentioned, they're produced predominantly by these types of macrophages, and they're involved in the upregulation of inflammatory reactions. And there is abundant evidence that certain of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as IL-1 beta, IL-6, TNF, are involved in this process of chemical nociceptive pain. And IL-6 and TNF, in particular, interact with nociceptors. And that interaction is what facilitates the transmission of pain signals through the nervous system into the brain where the pain is perceived. And this is the connection between, between inflammation and pain. This is how inflammation causes pain. Okay. I mentioned IL-1 beta. There's a drug that targets that as well. That drug is called canakinumab. Now, canakinumab was recently demonstrated in a lengthy clinical trial that finished up last year that was called the canakinumab anti-inflammatory thrombosis outcome study. This was a, a landmark clinical trial which showed that not only does inflammation play a significant role in uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, but by decreasing inflammation by using uh, canakinumab to inhibit the interleukin-1 beta pathway resulted in not only a significant decrease in inflammation, but also resulted in a significant decrease in the occurrence of recurrent cardiovascular events, which was independent of lipid lowering. So not only does cholesterol level play an uh, important role in the progression and the initiation of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, but so does inflammation. Now, there's an interesting case report in the literature from 2007 of a patient who was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis. Now, ankylosing spondylitis is a chronic, immune, uh, chronic inflammatory disease which affects the spine. And in its most severe form, it can cause what is called a bamboo spine. And that, and that name comes from the radiographic appearance when it's in an advanced stage. The spine can actually look like a piece of bamboo. Now, when this patient, not only did they have ankylosing spondylitis, but they also had Durkheim's disease. 
The patient was prescribed a combination of infliximab, a TNF inhibitor that I just mentioned, and methotrexate, which I also just mentioned. Now, the result being that while the patient was treated with this combination of medications, the pain associated with the Durkheim's disease resolved. Now, I should make mention that in this particular case, it was the infliximab that first resulted in a reduction of pain. It became necessary to, during the course of the patient's treatment to discontinue both of these drugs. And you can imagine what might have happened when those medications were discontinued. The pain associated with the Durkheim's disease returned. Well, so what does this mean? Well, it demonstrates that both of these drugs are active in the inflammation pathway of Durkheim's disease, both at IL-6 and at TNF, and that the inflammation pathway in Durkheim's disease is similar to those of rheumatoid arthritis and atherosclerosis. And here is an opportunity for a clinical study in Durkheim's disease using both in, in, uh, infliximab or methotrexate, either alone in combination versus placebo or however designed. Now this is what you see here is a, a diagram of the inflammation pathway in rheumatoid arthritis. And you see portrayed there in the center of the diagram very prominently is that big green blob. That's uh, the, and it's labeled the activated macrophage. And it's portrayed there predominantly because of the predominant role that it plays in rheumatoid arthritis. And if you look closely, you'll see depicted those, uh, the secretion of those pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now this diagram is the obesity associated uh, adipose tissue inflammation pathway. Now, and that's on the right side. And I would I bring your attention to a couple of important cells. If you look just above the bracket, you'll see a yellow cell there labeled M1. That's the MAC I've been talking about. Now if you look next to it at about the two o'clock position, there is labeled the CD8 positive T cell. That's a CD8 positive T cell or T cell lymphocyte, and that's the cell that I'm going to be focusing on in, in just a little bit. Now, if you look below, you'll see there depicted is the, uh, those pro-inflammatory cytokines that I've mentioned, and of course beneath that, uh, uh, insulin resistance, which I've also, also already mentioned. So what's, this no what's the first novel strategy? Well, the first novel strategy is the selective targeted inactivation of those M1 max by what is called folate receptor mediated endocytosis. And what this does it is it, by inactivating that cell, it eliminates its secretion of those pro-inflammatory cytokines, which by mechanisms we are, have already mentioned, reduces inflammation and reduces pain. Because once those, once TN, once those the macrophages contribution uh, to the production of those uh, inflammatory cytokines decreases, then they cannot interact with the nociceptors. So how is this done? Well, the vitamin folic acid, the vitamin folic acid, or B9, is a vitamin that's necessary for the production and maintenance of new cells in the body. Now, the normal healthy cells of the body acquire the vitamin folate by means of what's called the reduced folate carrier. These macrophages I've been talking about, these MACs, they acquire the vitamin folate through an entirely different mechanism called folate receptor mediated endocytosis. And the fact that these cells acquire the vitamin folate in a different manner than do the normal healthy cells was a remarkable serendipitous discovery made by two chemists at, the, at Purdue University while they were uh, researching cancer. And based upon this discovery, small molecule drug conjugates have been developed that can potentially be used in the treatment of chronic inflammatory disease. What's interesting is what they basically are is a construct of the vitamin folate which is linked to a conjugate by a proprietary chemical linker. Now, it's not only possible to conjugate drugs to this of various types, but also imaging agents of various types. For one example is, would be technetium-99. Okay, which would allow for the use of SPECT, for example, in imaging the targeted cells. Now this has been studied in adipose tissue in 2015 uh, as to whether or not uh, 
uh, macrophages uh, present in adipose tissue, these MACs, whether or not they express the folate receptor. And uh, indeed, it was found that subsets of them did express the folate receptor and that they could be targeted with folate drug conjugates. Now is a time where I need to stop for a moment because there's some late breaking news that's come out within the past couple of weeks. And I apologize if my sharing for this is going to run my time over a little bit, but it's, an, it's important news to share. This is not the only time, the only instance of macrophages present in adipose tissue being studied for the presence of the folate receptor. Just within the past couple of weeks, we received the news. Now, let me preface first what I'm about to say with the fact that because of research done by Dr. Karen Herbst, we know that there are macrophages present in the tissue in Durkheim's disease. Now, within the past couple of weeks, we just received the news that the macrophages in Durkheim's disease do indeed also express the folate receptor, and that they are in fact pro-inflammatory as was suspected, and that they too could be targeted with a folate small molecule dr drug conjugate. And special thanks go to Drs. Karen Herbst and Dr. Sarah Algabon, in co working in cooperation with Dr. June Liu, who's Director of Translational Research at Indocide Incorporated, and Dr. Philip S. Lau, who is the Ralph C. Corley Distinguished Professor of Chemistry at the Purdue University and his laboratory team at the Purdue University Institute for Drug Discovery. For all of them worked together in, de in making this important scientific discovery, which hopefully will eventually lead to a breakthrough in the treatment of Durkheim's disease. Now, I mentioned a folate small molecule drug conjugate. One in particular is the drug folate aminopterin. And as I said, it's, this, this drug is a, con, is a construct, again, of the vitamin folate, which is linked to the drug aminopterin by a proprietary chemical linker. Aminopterin is actually an antineoplastic drug, which is related to methotrexate. And methotrexate has also been used in the past uh, as an uh, anti, as a, a, antineoplastic drug but it's a much more potent anti-inflammatory than methotrexate. And in fact, in preclinical investigations with this particular drug, it was found to be more potent anti-inflammatory than either methotrexate or etanercept. The mechanism of action of this drug is that it selectively and targetedly binds the folate receptors on the surface of the activated macrophage which is then internalized by the process of endocytosis that brings the drug inside the cell. Once inside the cell, the drug and its payload are released, separated, and the, and the payload, or what is referred to as the warhead, then um, does, what, does what it's designed to do the cell, to the cell by inactivating it. Now, you know, I'd mentioned earlier that the vitamin folate, the normal healthy cells acquire that vitamin by means of the reduced folate carrier. Well, one of the things that this drug cannot do is enter the normal healthy cells because it cannot pass through that reduced folate carrier. So what does that mean? The drug bypasses all the normal cells and goes where it's supposed to go and does what it's supposed to do. It doesn't go other places and cause trouble that we don't want it, or that it's not wanted to, that we don't, wouldn't want it to cause. So what is, but what's the effect of that? Well, the effect of that is, is less toxicity and fewer side effects. So now I've mentioned that I was going to be talking about two types of cells in Durkheim's disease, the macrophages and the lymphocytes. Well, I'm done with the macrophages. Let's turn attention to the lymphocytes. They've also been found to be present and active in Durkheim's disease. Now, I'd mention, remember that CD8 plus T cell that I asked you to remember? That's a type of white blood cell that's a part of the immune system. And those CD8 positive T cells, they're also referred to as cytotoxic T cells. And they have been found to populate human adipose tissue and are associated with inflammation. Now, there's been some studies of these cells in adipose inflammation, and it's worth uh, uh, reading. 
These results support the notion that CD8 positive T cells have an essential role in the initiation and propagation of adipose inflammation. Uh, now, among these, CD8, uh, among these CD8 positive T lymphocytes, there is a subset that has previously encountered an antigen, therefore they possess memory. And of those cells, there is a subset called the central t memory T lymphocytes. Now these central memory T lymphocytes are which simply a type of, uh, of T lymphocyte that's previously encountered an androgen. They express what's called CC chemokine receptor 7, and they're commonly found in the lymph nodes. Now, the T cells that do not express CCR7, they're not found in the lymph nodes. CCR7 is involved in the homing of these CD8 positive T cells, like you saw in the diagram, to the lymph nodes. Now this has been studied in adipose tissue as to whether or not CCR7 had any influence or effect on adipose, T cell, uh, on adipose tissue T cell accumulation. And it's worth reading the findings of the study. Overall, results of the present study suggest that CCR7 plays an important role in CD8 positive adipose tissue T cell trafficking. It's been further studied, and I'll read this again too because it's important. Collectively, these results indicate that CCR8, CCR7 positive innate immune, T, innate immune cells are associated with adipose tissue inflammation both in mice and in humans. Now, um, one of the, another role that these CD8 positive T cells have, or the cytotoxic T cells in adipose tissue, is that they can recruit, both recruit and activate the macrophages. And this has been studied further in adipose tissue and, and was found that, what, that these CD8 positive T cells actually in the adipose, they precede the, uh, the recruitment. They, because they recruit them, they precede them in, uh, in the adipose tissue. And in this particular study, it says these results supported the notion that CD8 positive T cells and have an uh, essential role in both the initiation and the propagation of adipose inflammation. Now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit here and just men mention Crohn's disease and ulcerative, ulcerative colitis. These are chronic inflammatory bowel diseases that, uh, in which there is enhanced recruitment and retention of uh, both uh, macrophages and T cells and they, uh, where they then release the pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, in the intestinal tract. Now this, I mentioned these CCR7 CD8 positive lymphocytes. We now know that they are present in adipose tissue inflammation as I'd explained. The exit of these, and I also mentioned that they were found in the lymphatic circulation. Their exit from the lymph nodes into the bloodstream and to the sites of inflammation is dependent upon what's called the sphingosin one phosphate receptor. Now the sphingosin 1 phosphate receptor is in the class of G-coupled protein receptors and, is, and are the targets of the lipid signaling molecule sphingosin 1 phosphate. There are five subtypes of these receptors, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and they're involved in immune modulation and they are directly involved in the suppression of innate immune responses from the T cells or T lymphocytes. Now a class of drugs has been developed that takes advantage of this fact by modulating the sphingosin 1 phosphate receptors and by so doing they prevent the CCR7 positive, CD8 positive T cells from leaving the lymph nodes and then migrating to the sites of inflammation whether it be in the intestinal tract or in the, uh, in the subcutaneous adipose tissue or, uh, or elsewhere where there's sites of inflammation. Now, protect, remember I mentioned that the CCR7 negative CD8 positive T cells are not found, are not in the lymphatic circulation. Because of that, they don't affect them. So protective immunity is preserved in using this class of medications. Two of the drugs I'd like to discuss today are one is fingolimod. That's a first in class sphingosin 1 phosphate receptor modulator. And the second drug I'd like to mention is the drug ozonamod. So here we have the second of the two 
novel inflammation reduction, uh, reduction strategies which could be applied to uh, subcutaneous, inflammatory subcutaneous adipose tissue. This has been studied in adipose tissue in clinical development of the drug fingolimod. Uh, in preclinical development, it was designated FTY720. And in, 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 the, in that particular study uh, involving adipose tissue inflammation, it was found to actually inhibit, reduce uh, inflammation in adipose tissue. And one of the way, the mechanism of action of the way in which fingolimod inhibited adipose tissue inflammation is by actually reducing the population of both lymphocytes and macrophages in the adipose tissue. Now, fingolimod, it is a oral non-selective sphingosin 1 phosphate receptor modulator. It uh, works as, uh, as I had explained previously. It's a prodrug that is metabolized by the drug sphingosin, sphingos, by the enzyme sphingosin kinase to the active form fingolimod phosphate. Uh, fingolimod phosphate binds with high affinity to four of the five, five receptors, which is why it is referred to as being non-selective, and I've already described the mechanism of action. It's currently an available drug. It's been marketed and with an indicator of lymphocytes and macrophages. Now, I should point out that in the brain, the macrophages are also referred to as microglia. Now, there's some matters of the heart to take into consideration in using these drugs, and that's because the sphingosin 1-phosphate receptors also uh, help to serve to regulate heart rate and cardiac repolarization. In clinical development, the drug fingolimod was found to cause some transient first and second degree atrial ventricular blocks, as, long as, as well as a mild prolongation of the QT interval. And if this is going to happen in a patient, it's going to happen when this class of drugs is first administered. Therefore, the initial administration of the drug requires a period of, about, of at least six hours of cardiac monitoring. Uh, I should point out that the uh, QT prolongation QT uh, interval prolongation uh, with vingolimod was not uh, significant enough to warrant a black box warning. The cardiac safety of vingolimod is, was studied in a real world uh, trial of, six, of 850 patients who were receiving vingolimod for the first time. Uh, there were no episodes that required pharmacologic intervention for bradycardia or that required temporary cardiac pacing. Which brings us to the drug ozonamod. Ozonamod differs from fingolimod in that it is a selective sphingosin 1 phosphate 1 and sphingosin 1 phosphate 5 dual receptor modulator that works by the mechanism of action which I've already described. Fingolimod is currently in clinical development for multiple sclerosis, specifically relapsing multiple sclerosis, and for the treatment of chronic inflammatory bowel disease, specifically ulcerative colitis. And, uh, Crohn's, and Crohn's disease. Because of the fact it has no affinity for the third receptor, that confers an improved, uh, approved cardiac uh, uh, safety. The drug ozonamod, the cardiac safety of it, was also studied in a, a, a clinical trial. There was found to be no prolongation of the QT interval at a therapeutic dose of one milligram per day or a super therapeutic dose of two milligrams per day. The most significant uh, treatment emergent adverse events were some irritation of the skin due to the electrode take. So this, this whole concept of sphingosin 1 phosphate receptor modulation is a promising concept in immune-mediated chronic inflammation reduction. The clinical development and application the sphingosin 1-phosphate receptor modulating drugs provides an opportunity to apply and investigate this concept in a rare immune-mediated chronic inflammatory disease in which there is a significant unmet medical need, that being Durkheim's disease. Now, I had mentioned that there's currently a clinical trial and the use of ozonamod in Crohn's disease, specifically, it's in, uh, it's in regards to mo moderate to severe active Crohn's disease. Now, in regards to the trial, Durkheim's disease in and of itself is not an exclusion. 
Therefore, an individual who has both moderate to severe active Crohn's disease and Durkheim's disease could participate in this current clinical trial, provided they met all the inclusion criteria and none of the exclusion criteria. Now let me be clear. The purpose of the trial is not to assess either the safety or the efficacy of ozonamide in treating Durkheim's disease. But any information that might be obtained from such a person's participation as to the effect of ozonamide on the Durkheim's disease would, of course, be helpful information. Now, I'd mentioned these four, uh, these five receptors. This is a diagram of them. As you can see, fingolimod at the top, which modulates four of the five, and ozonamod there at the bottom on the right, which modulates one in five. None of these uh, class of drugs modulate the second receptor. Now, I just want to minish, mention for a moment interferon alpha 2b. There was a uh, case report in the literature of, a, of, a, of two patients who had, uh, who had uh, uh, hepatitis C that was active in w that were treated with this drug. Now, not only did they have hepatitis C, but they also had Durkheim's disease. What was found during the treatment of the hepatitis C with this interferon alpha 2b is that the pain associated with the Durkheim's disease resolved. We're not sure the mechanism of action of this. Perhaps it has something to do with the inflammatory cytokines. Uh, but here's another opportunity potentially for a clinical study on the use of, uh, using pegylated interferon alpha 2b, which is the currently available form of this drug and is used is with an indication as an adjunct in the treatment of multiple melanoma. This meeting is all about the potential next steps in the treatment of Durkheim's disease and lipedema. Now that we have a greater understanding of the inflammatory mechanisms in Durkheim's disease and potential therapeutic targets, there are opportunities now for the clinical development of the use of novel, novel targeted anti-inflammatory drugs as a treatment for Durkheim's disease. Now, I've not forgotten about the lipomas. You know, I've spent all this time talking about inflammation and how it relates to pain and some ways we can reduce it. But in the course of treating a patient who has Durkheim's disease, sometimes it becomes necessary to surgically remove the lipomas, which is an invasive procedure, involves pain. Well, in the future, it may not always be necessary to refer the patient to the surgeon if a lipoma needs to be removed because there is a technology available now that has the potential, that can, that has the potential to be used for the non-invasive, painless elimination of lipomas. And although, and the potential to become a non-invasive tool in the treatment of Durkheim's disease in which, in cases where the lipoma needs to be removed. What this does, it involves multiple beams of high intensity focus ultrasound that are focused to a very precise point. And where that point comes together, there are mechanical and thermal effects uh, thermal effects being the ablation of the targeted tissue. This is done under real-time magnetic resonance thermometry guidance where the focal point can be targeted uh, and, and, where the, and where the focal point is targeted then what's, uh, or what are called sonications are applied which uh, results in the ablation of tumor tissue. This can be applied to various types of benign and malignant tumors depending upon their location in the body. This is an uh, image of a magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound equipment. You'll see there the table and embedded within the table is the focused ultrasound equipment and this is, uh, and you see there an MRI and that's typically a 3T MRI. This is the concept of high intensity focused ultrasound application to lipomas has been studied and has been shown to effectively, non-invasively reduce lipoma size. Not only can uh, focused ultrasound be guided through MRI, but it can also be guided by the ultrasound, and this is an image of an ultrasound-guided focused ultrasound unit. Now, in closing, let me just share a quote with you uh, from uh, my now-deceased friend and colleague, Mr. John Kansas, who, after having been diagnosed with cancer, and experiencing the harsh side effects of chemotherapy, thought to himself, there has to be a better way. 
And despite the fact that he had no medical knowledge background whatsoever, he invented a new method of treating malignant tumors without the need for surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy, and with no side effects. Perhaps there may be a patient who has Durkheim's disease who's thinking to themselves, there has to be a better way. To you, I would say, hopefully in the future, 